Often we forget that Christianity is the following of one man, Jesus Christ. There are many different worldviews and teachers to mimic and follow, but Christians choose Jesus. We don't just admire him as a good teacher and a prophet. We believe he is the Son of God. Because of his own claim to be the Son of God, we submit our lives to what he said and commit to follow his teachings. What did he say? Many have only heard rumors of what he said. Others have read what he said and came away with wrong interpretations of what he said. Our hope during this series is to understand what Jesus actually taught and to model our lives accordingly. We want to be Christians. We want to be Christ followers. Join me as we study the words in red in this series entitled, The Jesus Way. I'm so excited about launching this brand new series today called The Jesus Way. And again, I just greet all of our campuses. I love you so much. Uh, can you guys believe we're already in June in the middle of the summer and all of our parents are going crazy right now trying to figure out what to do with the kids. And um, let me give you a little history about this series and tell you where we're going with it and how important and vital it is. A few months ago, I went on a vacation with my family and we rented a motorhome and took it up to the Smoky Mountains. Uh, talk about a chaotic vacation. Uh, I don't know if I recommend it or not. It just, it, it, it was pretty crazy. We had a good time though. And we were driving through the, the mountains of North Carolina. And right about that time, the group ISIS had just started murdering people. And I, it was all in the news. They, would, they beheaded a journalist. And, and I remember feeling the shock and the horror that many people felt as they would see in the newspaper just these wicked heinous acts of terrorism. And I started thinking about the contrast between that world of hatred and violence and the world that Jesus Christ represents and the love of Jesus Christ and how desperately the world needs the message and the teaching of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the face of love to the planet. The world needs Jesus. They're dying, they're hungry for the message of Jesus. And I began to be burdened. What could I do for the Middle East? What could I do? Because you could send money, you can send millions of dollars and it just goes into a, a, an abyss. But I believe the teachings of Jesus Christ can revolutionize people's lives. Many people have only heard rumors about what Jesus taught. And to them, they... They have speculations that are totally taken out of context. If you say, say to somebody, what did Jesus teach? They say, well, uh, he said, don't judge people. Uh, and you know, they, they have these ideas, but a lot of them are totally taken out of context when really the teachings of Jesus Christ are very radical. They're very transformational. And it is a way of lifestyle that should be recognized by the world. You cannot say that you're a Christian and not adopt his way of life, his teaching of life. It's a way of forgiveness. It's a way of love. It's a way of peace. And, and the teachings of Jesus Christ are so powerful. And God began to put on my heart to do a series based upon the teachings of Jesus. And so I endeavored to try to figure out what all did Jesus teach? And I started off with like a 50-week series. Aren't you glad I didn't end up there? I backed it down to 40 weeks and 30 weeks and condensed it more to 20 weeks and I kept packing it in, kept packing it in and I got it down to nine weeks of what I feel like Jesus taught. And the potential of this series, we may end up making it a discipleship track for people around the world. We may end up doing small videos to be aired in the Middle East to just communicate who was Jesus and what did Jesus teach. And so it is a very simple uh, message. It is a very simple series, but it is so life-changing if you apply yourself. Many people say, I've been serving God 20 years. Why do I need to hear the basics, the fundamentals? I'm going to ask you to clear everything you've ever known about Christianity, and let's go right back to the very beginning of Jesus Christ as a person and his teachings and applying those teachings to our life. You know, today there's a lot of different teachings that you can follow. You can watch Dr. Phil and say, man, I like Dr. Phil's teachings. I wanna subscribe and live my life like Dr. Phil teaches. You can watch Oprah and say, man, Oprah has got it together. I just love her angle on religion and God and, and I'm just gonna follow her teachings. Or God forbid, you could follow Dr. Oz's teachings and then totally be astray. Um, 
There's lots of, or you may subscribe to your college professors to teach teachings. He talks about evolution and he talks about uh, all these different philosophies and you say, man, that is right. There's all kinds of teachings, but Jesus Christ had teachings when he came to the world. He didn't just stand there, he spoke and the words that came out of his mouth was meant to be lived out by us. And as a Christian, what you do is you put everybody else to the side You put the Dr. Phil's and the Oprah's and the Dr. Oz's and the rabbi such and such and all of those, you push them to the side and you say, I'm obsessed with this man, Jesus, and what he taught. And I'm gonna live my life based on what he taught. And so I wanna talk about the teachings of Jesus Christ over these next night and they're gonna be life changing, I can promise you. But today, the, way, the, the, the place that we have to start is why do we listen to Jesus? Is he a man? Is he a teacher? Is he a prophet? Is he just a, per, is he just a historical figure? Because many people in Jesus' day said, on whose authority do you make these claims? Or whose authority are you teaching? Because if Jesus is God and Jesus created you and he's the reason why we're all here, how many of you know nobody else's teaching matters except for the designer of it all, the architect of it all? And if he says something and this is the way to live, we subscribe ourselves to that. I would say this, that Christianity Christianity is not just knowing about Jesus, but it's submitting your life to his teaching and saying, I'm going to look like that. That's Christianity. It's not just a title. It's not something hereditary. You don't inherit it from your parents. It's not just because you're an American. You make a choice that this man is God and I subscribe to his teachings and I want to look like what he talks about. Let's take a second and talk about Jesus Christ as a figure. How revolutionary is Jesus? Because what is not up for debate today is whether or not he was historical. Every secular historian says he's real. So we're not even gonna have the debate of whether or not he was real. So then we have to say, how has he impacted humanity? Well, let me say this, that no single person in history has impacted the world like the carpenter, Jesus Christ. He only lived 33 short years, but yet time itself is defined by his existence. We have BC and we have AD. Even atheists have to say 2015. 2015 years since when? Since Jesus Christ walked the planet all over the globe, people know that he is the epicenter of time. He's the epicenter of everything. He's the center of it all. Right now across the globe, 70% of the globe recognize the name and the face of Jesus Christ. That's more than uh, Britney Spears, it's more than Lady Gaga, it's more than President Obama, it's more than Coca-Cola. People recognize the name Jesus Christ. Not only that, but they recognize the face of Jesus Christ. And although some pictures have him with some makeup, some have him with long hair, some have him with short hair, and all different shades, when people see a picture of Jesus, they say, that's Jesus. We're talking about the most important figure in all of humanity because he wasn't just man, he was God in flesh. And that's why we're still reeling from his existence even 2015 years later. Google itself is blown away by the amount of searches for the, for the person Jesus. Every month, this month, 24,999,000 searches for the name Jesus. If you Google search Jesus, you will have 800 million results because that's how many people are talking about him. He's the most trending topic on Twitter through the span of time, Jesus Christ. He stands there, you can't ignore him. And the biggest question that we have to answer is who is he? Is he a liar? Is he a lunatic or is he Lord? Most people don't want to deal with the question. They know Jesus was a real person, but if you ask them who was he, they say, I don't know. I, I, I really don't feel like dealing with that right now. i got so many other things I'm dealing with. I don't want to have to confront that. It, who is he? But I'm telling you, it's the most important question in your life. Who is Jesus? Well, let me say a few things about his name. Say the name Jesus everywhere all across the city. Jesus. Let's say it one more time with some volume. Jesus. Okay, that's the most important name in all of human history, Jesus. We say the name is beautiful, and it's not just because it is, uh, the syllables are beautiful. I can think of probably prettier names with syllables, but people call him 
Jesus or Jesus or all these different things. Is it beautiful because of the way it sounds? No, it's beautiful because of what it means. And only in today's world do we name people based upon what it sounds like. We name people and we think, man, I don't like how that sounds. Let's name them something different. And rarely do we look at what the name means. But when Jesus was born, they didn't care what the name sounded like. They cared only about what it meant. So they would only name somebody based upon what the name meant. So the name, we don't say the name Jesus is beautiful because it sounds pretty, Jesus. We say it is beautiful because what it means. When God decided to become flesh, he said, I want him to be named Jesus, which means... Savior. If God wanted to condemn the world, he would have sent a a condemner and said, name him condemner. But he decided to send a savior and he said, call him savior. Above everything that he is, he is a savior. So his name itself means savior, the savior of humanity, the savior of you, the savior of your family, the savior of the world, Jesus Christ. It's him we preach, it's him I preach. I have nothing to give, but it's all about Jesus. If you have Jesus, you have life. And so his name means Savior. The reason why his name also is significant, because out of all the names that God has given in the Bible, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Sidkenu, Jehovah Nisi, all these different names, the great I am, Jesus is the only name for God as a human. God became human and walked among us, and his name was Jesus Christ. That's why his name is so valuable to us. I love Jehovah Nisi. I love Jehovah Jireh. I love uh, Jehovah Sidkenu. I love all those names. But God got a face, and his name is Jesus. And so that's why we love the name Jesus, is because it means that God cared about us enough to become one of us. Really who Jesus is is God with a face. Woo! God with a face. There's a story I read about a girl that went on vacation with her family and she didn't recognize the cabin that she was staying in. And uh, that night her mom put her to bed and when the mom walked out, she cried out for her mom to come back. And her mom came and her mom said, what do you need, baby? She said, well, will you stay with me? She said, no, I can't, I'm gonna sleep in the other room. She said, well, it's dark. And the mom said, it's okay, baby, God is here. God is everywhere. And she says, but God, I need, I need a God with a face. And when I read that, I thought about all of us, how we need a God with a face. I mean, it seems like he's so invisible and he's so up there, but God got a face and walked among us and his name is Jesus. And so what will you do with Jesus? Why follow his teachings over Dr. Fields or Oprah's or Oz or any of these guys? Why follow his teachings? Well, it's because he's the son of God. And I want to read a scripture in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, that talks about his divinity. If you ever want to know about the divinity of Jesus Christ, this is one of the most potent, powerful passages in all of the New Testament that describes his divinity. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Paraphrase, he's God with a face. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. Guys, you were created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. Guys, he's the head of this church. We're all assembled here today in his name. You haven't given up your Sunday to come here and sit in a comfortable pew and hear some good music and hang out with some people. You came here today assembled by the head of the church, Jesus Christ. He summoned you. He called you into this place. I'm not the head of this church. He's the head of this church, and he leads, and he's pulling us all together. He is the beginning, supreme over all who will rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. We're talking about Jesus. Now, let me tell you a story that happened. After Jesus ministered for several years, the disciples saw him walk on water, raise the dead, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers. They saw him change water into wine. They saw some crazy stuff. And so it comes to a moment where Jesus is about to go to be crucified and it's the crux of everything. Jesus has a conversation with his disciples and this is how it goes in Matthew 16. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, so guys, who were people saying 
that I am? How are people labeling me? Are they labeling me a good person, a good teacher, a prophet, a miracle worker? He asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist. Because the Jewish people actually believed in a form of reincarnation where these prophets that it was prophesied would come back. And what God was saying through the prophets was a type of that person would come, but they actually believed that that person would come back. So they said, it's John the Baptist reincarnated. Some say it's Elijah reincarnated. Others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And then he asked them the most important question for all of us and the most relevant question today is, but who do you say that I am? I want you to ask the person next to you, who do you say he is? Come on, who do you say he is? And you feel the freedom to answer him if you want to. Well, of course he's Jesus, but who is Jesus? He's the son of God. So he said, who, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you're blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. And then in the next chapter, this is like a week later, Jesus takes his top three disciples up on a mountain. Now, Peter had already said, you are God. I recognize you as God. You're not just a good teacher. You are God. So this is what happened. Jesus, as the men watched Jesus, uh, he, brought, he brought him on a mountain. And then verse two, as the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed so that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. Suddenly Moses and Elijah appeared, which represents the law and the prophets. And the Jewish people were so hung up on the law and the prophets. They were trying to fulfill the law and they were trying to look forward to the prophets. So those two guys showed up and they began talking with Jesus. Verse four, Peter exclaimed, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. It's like, Peter, shut up, man. Just, just hang out, just chill. You know, you always open your mouth. Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. If you want, I'll make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But even as he spoke, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my dearly loved son. So God has spoken about who he is. This is my boy, this is my son. And then he said, whom brings me great joy. Listen to him. The disciples were terrified and fell face down on the ground. Then Jesus came over and touched them. Get up, he said, don't be afraid. And when they looked up, the law and the prophets were gone and they saw only Jesus. As a Christian, your identity you have to push everything else to the side and see only Jesus. This is such a pivotal point. This is so important in your life because you think about all the identities that you have. You have your family identity. You have your racial identity. You have your political identity. You have all these identities that say who you are. But when you become a Christian, everything pushes to the side. This is huge. This is, this is why a lot of people turn away from Jesus, because they got their identities and they want to add Jesus into it. They say, come, come and join the party of all of my identity. Jesus is saying, no, I'm everything. My teaching is everything. You take my yoke upon you. And as a believer, you abandon everything and see only Jesus, the Son of God. And you're there in your outline I have a couple of thoughts. The first is how the Father labeled Jesus. How did the Father God label Jesus? The Father labeled him, my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So guys, God, your creator, has spoken from heaven and said about Jesus that he's my son in whom I'm well pleased. I love this thought that in the gospels, every time God the Father talks, he's talking about his son, his boy, Jesus Christ. They God, what do you think? This is my beloved son, do what he says. What else do you think? This is my boy. Do what he says. Throughout the Gospels, every time the father speaks, he's talking about his son. It's God's favorite topic, Jesus. So how did the disciples label Jesus? Well, the Bible says that they worshiped him. For a Jewish person to worship a man 
was blasphemy, was idolatry. They were programmed that I shall not make a, 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 an idol, I won't make a graven image, and I'll worship nobody but God. So for his disciples, after hanging out with him for a few years, to take a knee and to worship Jesus, it means that they recognized him as God. Peter said, you're a Messiah, the Son of God. And this is one of the coolest ones, is Thomas, the doubter. When he had heard Jesus resurrected from the dead, he said, I don't believe it. I won't believe it unless I touch him. I won't believe it. And Jesus appeared out of nowhere and he said, hey, Thomas, Come here, put your finger in my side, put your finger in my hand. Don't doubt anymore. And this is what Thomas said, my Lord and my God. God is a big word. Jesus is not just a man, he is God. He's the son of God, the disciples. So if those guys labeled him like that, how did the demons label Jesus? Demons are real. We live in the physical world, but before this physical world was ever here, God had created the spiritual world. He created all of the angels. And when Jesus was on the planet, demons recognized the Son of God. And we'd be, they would be in an atmosphere very much like this, and somebody would shriek out. The demons in them would shriek out and say, leave us alone, Son of God. One of the examples is in Mark chapter 3 and verse 10. He had healed many people that day, so all the sick people eagerly pushed forward to touch him. Whenever those possessed by evil spirits caught sight of him, the spirits would throw them to the ground in front of him, shrieking, you are the son of God. Demons knew he's the son of God. Angels know he's the son of God. Hebrews chapter one, they recognize it, okay? So then let's go to the most important thing. How, do, how does the world label Jesus? Well, the world labels him a madman. Some people just say, he's a madman. Nazareth, Jesus' hometown said he's a madman. Guys, if you read today's, articles and, and things uh, that are being released. You know, on a lot of news articles, you can have comments beneath it. And sometimes I peruse those comments just to see the status of the hearts of people. And it blows me away how many people hate Jesus the Christ. They hate Christians and they hate Jesus. And some people label him as a false, as a fraud. Some people say that he was just a good person. There's no doubt that he's a historical person. But now let's talk about how did Jesus label himself? Jesus made some pretty outrageous statements. Throughout time and even in our day, people make outrageous statements about themselves. David Koresh, almost a decade ago, or a little over a decade ago, claimed in Waco, Texas, that he was the son of God. Well, that didn't turn out too good. There's been a lot of people who've said that they are the Messiah, the son of God. So Jesus comes along and just like any other crazy person, it seemingly, he says, I'm God's son. And, and if you would have been there, you would have been like, you're crazy. Yeah, right. But then he began to demonstrate his power over nature. He never met a person that he could not heal. He never met a leper that he could not cleanse. He never met a dead person that he could not raise. He never met a, a, a physical element that he could not conquer. He walked on water and turned water into wine. We're talking about total dominance. And so people that were around him began to recognize, I don't know what he is, but he's different than us. Something is up here. And then when he resurrected from the dead, he proved his total dominance of even death. So Jesus made outrageous claims about himself. And in John, you have it there in your outline, he made seven crazy statements about himself. And they all begin with, I am. By saying that I am, but when he said I am, he was connecting to the Jewish mind. When, when God appeared to Moses and said, go free the people from Egypt, he said, who should I say sent me? He said, tell them I am sent you. And so when Jesus steps up and says, I am, he's connecting himself to God who appeared to Moses and, say, and, and he's saying, I am. So who did he say I am? He said, I am the bread of life. Bread of life, what do you even mean by that? Well, have you ever been to a point in your life where you're unsatisfied with life, where you're, you're hungry for something more? You're tired of just going to work and coming home or going to school, and you're just like, man, is this it? That's called being unsatisfied. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. Anybody who takes of me will never hunger again. In other words, there's a total satisfaction. He says, I am the thing that everybody's missing. I am the thing that brings satisfaction. And then he said of himself in John 8, I'm the light of the world. If you walk in me, you won't walk in darkness. In other words, the world is in darkness and confused and don't know where they're going. But Jesus said, you have me, you have the light. You won't be searching for direction anymore. And I can say this as I've been following Jesus Christ in my life, I am fulfilled by the bread of life. And I can see because I have the light of God around me. 
Take it from somebody who loves and serves Jesus Christ. It is good to have Jesus in my life. And then in John 10, he makes a daring statement, I'm the door. The best way I can illustrate what that means is if you were in a jail cell and it was pitch black and you were walking around trying to find the way out of the jail cell and you push up against cinder, cinder blocks and you push up against iron gates and you can't figure the way out and then you come to the only way out of the jail, which is a door, Jesus is saying, I am that, I am the door. So if you want freedom in your life, if you want out of the prison of sin, if you want out of, I am the door, gotta come through me to get out of jail and then he follows it up and he says, I am the good shepherd. In other words, I take care of my people. Everybody else in the world doesn't have a shepherd. Everybody else out there is in trouble. They're, they're lost, but we have a good shepherd. And he connected to Psalm 23 when he says, I am the good shepherd. And then he followed it up and made another outrageous claim. And to, to this point, it was still the craziest one yet. He said, I'm the resurrection and the life in John 11. He said, he who believes in me, even though they die, shall not perish. What he was saying is, is if you want to be immortal, I'm the only way. Come on, take a praise break right there. Just praise God. Who wants to be immortal? Who wants to live forever? Jesus is the only way. I am the resurrection and the life. And then he followed it up later in John 14. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. In other words, he has the only way to get access to Papa, Papa God, your creator. If you wanna know your creator, you gotta come through Jesus Christ because he's standing there in front of him. Nobody gets to the Father unless by me. You can try to come through uh, Mr. Muhammad or Hare Krishna, or you can try yoga, or you can try all these different people's paths. And, and that's one of the things Oprah says is, hey, you got, all paths lead to God. It just all gets there. Where Jesus stands and makes an outrageous claim and says, I am the only way to the Father. And I hate that. I mean, when you talk to people and they say, I'm doing this or I'm doing that, and in their multiple ways to God, and you have to say, I'm sorry. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody gets to the Father except through me. That's a pretty outrageous claim. You got to figure out what you're going to do with that claim. Then he concludes in John 15, and he says, I am the vine which means if you stay plugged into me, you're gonna flourish. If you disconnect from me, you're gonna die. So he declares that he is the son of God. And when questioned by the Sanhedrin, they said, tell us straight up, are you the son of God? And he looked up quietly and he says, it is as you say. And then he said, and you will see the son of man coming on the clouds. Guys, one day Jesus the Christ is going to come back. No other religion, no other God is coming back. Jesus Christ is going to come riding on the clouds. As a Christian, you have to draw a line in the sand and abandon everything else and, and put all of your eggs in this basket and say, <laughs> I'm in. I'm totally in, Jesus. I believe you're God. I believe what you say is true. I buy in. You hear how radical this is? This is not just passive. I mean, this is a massive statement in life that I choose the Jesus way because of the Jesus character, the Jesus person. So then which brings us to a super important thing, and it's there in your outline. Who do you say he is? How do you label Jesus? Some of you may have to check the box. I'm not ready to label him. If you do, I would just say, if you can't label him now, what makes you think you're gonna label him later? You have to label him today. You have to label, put a label on him. Who is he? Who is he that says he's the son of God? C.S. Lewis said something so powerful. He said, he's either one of three things. He's either a liar or he's a lunatic or he's Lord. So out of the thousands of people that are sitting here and you're listening to my words, this comes down to a person. It comes down to you, sir. It comes down to you. Who do you say Jesus is? Is he a liar? 
Did he lie about his divinity? Did he lie about everything? Is he a crazy person? I have a hard time believing that a crazy man that only lived 33 years and was a carpenter could change the course of human history. And we're 2015 years later still talking about this person and worshiping him. It would have fallen apart a long time ago if he was a crazy person. So if he's not a liar and he's not a lunatic, then he is Lord and he deserves your worship and your total submission and obedience. So following the Jesus way comes down to following the person, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Every time somebody had a revelation that he was the Son of God, they moved from being a friend to all of a sudden bowing down and worshiping him. John in the revelation, Jesus appeared behind John and John was friends with Jesus. John was the one that laid his head on Jesus' chest. They were tight, but when he saw Jesus, the Bible said he fell at his feet like a dead person because he recognized the divinity of Jesus Christ. And so how we're going to conclude this service, uh, and this is going to be a special moment for, for many of you guys because some of you are going to reassert your declaration of who Jesus is. He's not just a side item in your life. He's not just something you add to everything else you've got. He's it. You're going to reassert him as Lord, as God. Some of you today or for the first time, maybe you were raised in a Christian home, maybe you were baptized as a little kid and you've said, man, I'm a Christian because I'm an American. No, you're a Christian because you buy in to him and to his teaching. Some of you today are gonna make that decision and you're gonna say, I turn my back on my past, I turn my back on my life and I am all in. I'm all in to Jesus. Eternally, there's only two kingdoms that are gonna last. I wish it were true that America would last forever, but it's not. No kingdoms on, on this world are gonna last forever. The kingdom of darkness that's separated from God forever will last and the kingdom of light is gonna last. And that king of that kingdom is Jesus Christ. He's the way, the truth, and the life into that kingdom. If you want in the kingdom, you gotta come to him and say, I want in. I don't wanna be in that other kingdom. I wanna be in this kingdom, the kingdom of God. And so right now, Everybody that's watching, if you're watching on television or you're watching on internet, it's decision time. It's your decision time. I'd like us all to bow our heads and close our eyes at all of our campuses. But if you're here and you would say, Pastor, God has spoken to me today. I feel God dealing with my heart. I've had some type of religion or I've, I've known, I believe that Jesus is real, but I've never really surrendered my life to him. I've never submitted my heart to him. If that's you today, you have the privilege and I have the privilege of leading you into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Don't leave out these doors without yielding your heart to him, repenting of sin, turning your back on that life and accepting Jesus Christ as the son of God into your life. This is the entrance to the Jesus way. You cannot go around this door. You can try to do what he said. You can try to love people. You can try to serve people. You can try to forgive people. But if you don't come through the door, which is admitting that he's the son of God and making him the Lord of your life, then you're not in the door. You're just trying to copy. You're trying to mimic. Today, you have to walk through the door. But if you'd say, pastor, I would love to pray and I, I love a relationship with Jesus Christ. His name means savior. That's what his name means. He wants to save you. He loves you so much more than I ever could or your mama ever could or your daddy ever could. He loves you. And today he's drawing you. If you say, pastor, you're speaking to me and I wanna give my heart to Jesus Christ. Without hesitation at all of our campuses, I'd love you to slip your hand up and say, that's me. Pray with me. Okay, all right, all right. Lift it high, 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 lift it high. Wow, wow, wow. Lift it high, lift it high. At all of our campuses, God sees your hand. Lift it up, say, pray with me. I want Jesus, I choose Jesus. Man, so many people are making decisions for Christ. Now you can slip your hands down. This is what we're gonna do. We're all gonna say this prayer together. Christians, it doesn't matter if you've been saved 30 years, we're gonna make a fresh declaration about who he is to us. We're gonna declare that he's the son of God. We're gonna profess that with our mouth, believe it in our heart. Those of you that just lifted your hands, this is your first time, or maybe you're rededicating your life. This is a huge moment for all of us. Let's say this with boldness. Let's say it with courage. Say, son of God, Jesus Christ, I believe that you are who you said you are. You are the son of God. And because of that, I give my life to you. I yield my life to you. I am not my own. I am yours. I repent of sin. 
I turn my back on sin and I look to you to be the bread of life, to be the light of the world, to be the door, to be the good shepherd, to be the resurrection and the life, to be the way and the truth and the life, to be the vine. I give you my heart. Take me. I love you, Jesus. I want to follow you. Let heaven make a record of this moment and my profession of faith. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. Come on, let's celebrate with every person that just made a decision for Christ. Come on, you can do better than that, man. People giving their hearts to Jesus. Hey! Thanks for joining us today for Bethany's Weekend Experience. We hope that you were encouraged and challenged during the message. If you made a decision to follow Christ, or maybe you've rededicated your life to the Lord, we want to encourage you to tell someone about it. Tell your family, a friend, and feel free to tell us about it by clicking the Talk About It button on our homepage. If you need prayer for anything else, just go to our homepage and click Request Prayer button. We'd love to have you join us or come visit one of our four campuses for a live worship experience. We hope you had a great day, and we'll see you next time.